Joe here, and today we have a very special video. I have a guest with me, Jack Rady, the designer of Corzoon Pocket and upcoming Corzoon Pocket 2. Jack, how are you doing? I'm doing all right. It's <laughs> raining out here in Oregon. I like that. Okay, that's good. That's good to have rain once in a while. I wish we had rain in Puerto Rico these days, too. So, uh, you, uh, this uh, game that you design is very special. I know it is. It is, uh, I think it was your first published game, right? That's correct. And when, when, when people interview designers, they always ask the classic question, how did you become a designer? But to be a designer, you have to be a war gamer first, kind of, right? Uh, every designer was a war gamer first. And in fact, it is one of the structural problems in the hobby that the artists also then have to be businessmen and that seldom really works smoothly <laughs> yeah, yeah no, no, no. and there's another point in there uh -huh. which is for a long time many war gamers think of designers as kind of some deities i mean the people who understand the mysteries can make a combat results table wow do research fact is every single designer was a war gamer first and most of you can do a pretty good war game design if you're willing to put in the work. Okay. And one thing I've noticed with war game designers is that the, the thing that drives them is that they played some games on a particular subject and said, you know, this game is missing this, you know, so That's I can right. do and add this better. And I hear that like common theme. But before we get to that, because I'm sure it's happened to you, how did you become a war game? Okay, that's a good story because I was born in 1947. I'll be 75 in a couple of weeks, yikes. Well, that was just in the aftermath of World War II. I grew up without a television, so I read a lot of books. And in my school library, there were a lot of memoirs by World War II veterans. It was the subject of what was going on. By the time I was aware, um, the Korean War, and my stepfather was had came back as lieutenant um, from Korea. Um, first day babysitting me, he um, because he was first a babysitter, and then my stepfather, he um, drew a picture of a 4.2 mortar and labeled it the base plate, the tube, the site, you know, the elevator. Then he drew another picture without the labels on it and said, "Okay, label them." <laughs> okay. Um, so I developed an interest in military matters. And to be quite frank, growing up without a father, um, I was really curious what guys did. You know, what's, what's, what do I model myself on? And a prominent model was soldiering. That's about as male as you could get. So that was where I was facing. And I read voraciously and I got toy soldiers. Um, we all started with toy soldiers, I suspect. Yes, um, I could go in the other room and bring you. I've got a few of the originals left, wow. plus my Britons Limited, which are stored up in the attic, uh, wrapped in paper. Um, but so I was interested in military matters from the time I was in second grade on. 
And with my friends, I played war games, except we had no rules. Um, some of the rules were essentially the one that shouts the loudest and the longest wins the issue. Um, we played with toy soldiers and we played a fantasy campaign game with no written rules and no game master. We just argued it out as we went, dividing the rule up into kingdoms and stocking them with fantastic animals. And blah, 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 blah. Okay, imagination. Yeah. I had it. Um, I grew up without a television. It really helps. Um, but so... In 1960, I grew up in Chicago, and in 1960, I was at the Museum of Science and Industry um, with my grandfather, and they have a gift shop and bookstore, not a bookstore, a gift shop um, right next to the giant model train layout, and this is in a hall that features a stuka, a real stuka hanging from the ceiling with a real hurricane diving in on it. And these are, okay, and there's a U-boat parked outside, the U-505. So this was a place I went not infrequently, but there in the gift shop, up behind the counter, were two big flat boxes. And one had a tank on it, and the other, I can't even remember what the box looked like, but the word Gettysburg and Tactics 2 were visible. And I said, and they were $6 each. And I said to my grandfather, <laughs> and by God, he bought them for me. And I took them home and I opened the box for tactics too. And what is this? A hard map of an odd look, you know, divided into squares and these little pieces of cardboard and some rules that I, could not understand. I was expecting to open the box and have the experience of an army commander. You know, where's my where's my radios? Where where is my corporal making me coffee? What what is this? Um, I didn't know what to do with it, so I put it aside. But I went to a high school that had some rather interesting people in it. I was a freshman, and there was a pair of seniors named David Friedman and Charles Fitterman. And David Friedman is the son of Milton Friedman. That Milton Friedman. Yeah, the Milton. Um, <clears throat> and we became very good friends because we were all atheists and all Jewish atheists, and we were all interested in military stuff. And the two of them were right wing as hell, and I was not. Um, <laughs> But they taught me, they also had a copy of Tactics 2. And they showed me how to play it. And within a month, we had devised, David and I had devised first turn plans that will guarantee you victory from either side. And we wrote to Charles Roberts and we said, this is our plan. It involves dropping paratroops to seize a port and immediately am, you know, sending in by naval transport that allows you to overwhelm the smaller part of your opponent's force before he gets to move. Um, well, the game is, is broken, legit. you're saying. <laughs> and Charles replied, yes, that's the legitimate move. So we were fairly <laughs> pleased, but the game was no longer of interest. Um, I messed around with Gettysburg a lot, didn't really quite get it. Um, and it was- was that, was that the Gettysburg with the, with the squares? Yeah. And the, the long counters. Yeah, and, yeah I have um, that one. Yeah. <laughs> different size and shapes. Yeah. And I, I did a lot of messing around at the edges of game design with it before I put it away. Um, so, but that's how I got into war game. Next, Jack talks about Core Zoom Pocket. But to give you an idea first of the size of this game, let's take a look at the setup for one of the four map scenarios. This is a setup for scenario seven, Massacre on the Giniloy Dikich.
So Jack, Corsun Pocket, it's a operational monster game. And uh, it's, uh, you spoke, it's, a, it's a particular topic that we're interested in you because you had both sides at times defending and attacking, which makes it interesting for both players. But like every game, you know, you can't focus on everything. What did you want to focus on and, and show in detail and which other things you wanted to gloss over? Okay. Um, let me start with the gloss. Uh, command and morale both play an important role um, in a situation like this and are entirely appropriate to model in a smaller model. I thought at this level, the game does not need more systems. In the original design, I focused heavily on supply because as an encirclement, supply was critical. There is a lack of good roads and being able to maintain a supply road um, is vital to being able to keep troops fighting. Um, and there are very few and they're not very good and the weather changes. And when it gets real funky, um, it's very hard to move supplies. Well, I was sick and tired of Hollywood six shooter games, I call it. That is, your artillery can fire all day long, every day, as long as you can trace a supply line, and it's legitimate, no matter what length, it's assumed you're getting everything you need. All the shells, all the beans, um, all the gasoline, everything, all the medical supplies, and that doesn't have a lot to do with reality. Um, unless you're in the United States Army operating in a situation with good roads behind you, then probably you can do all of that, but um, nobody else. And not certainly here mm -hmm. in the Ukraine in the middle of winter or the end of winter. So I focused heavily on supply and I had no models from other games really to draw from. And I used both supply points and artillery ammunition points, which had to be moved around the board. Um, and there was limited ability to do so. So you had to pick and choose, where are you moving your artillery ammunition to? Where is it gonna sit now? It's gotta be within reach of the guns for them to use it. Um, okay, so you've spent two or three days, you know, um, six to nine turns moving, stockpiling artillery ammunition a bit at a time, but you've got a good pile over here. And then just the day before the turn before you're going to launch your barrage, your opponent backs up. Now he's out of range. Mm -hmm. So you got to drag the guns forward, re register them, and drag the shells forward. What a pain in the tusks. Um, and that seemed like a brilliant idea to me you know i'm going to make these guys do the work that they've been too lazy to do and i'm going to play my the essence of game design is giving the player more opportunities than he has resources to deal with and introducing as much uncertainty into his mind as you can we'll leave that second one aside that was another thing i did i glossed in this game it was not in Wacht am Rhein, and I didn't see adding it. All of this supply stuff was good. It put realistic restrictions on the players, and it was as much of a pain for the players as it had been historically for the commanders. I mean, at one point, the Soviets were sending fuel and ammunition particularly fuel up to the front by delivering 55 gallon drums to a village by truck, probably an American truck, which could make it through any mud, unloading them and telling the village, okay, we need some volunteers to roll these barrels to the next village, roll them to the next village, then you can come home um, and then they'll find volunteers to roll them to the next village. Um, and this is how they were getting supplies through. Um, so I thought 
realistically, the players should have a burden. But new designer syndrome, I hadn't realized the simple rule, more counters, less rules. Fewer counters, more rules. Yeah. Constant is time. Um, you know, that's the one that's not variable. So you can vary the balance of the other two, but if you go high on both, you run out of time. Um, you will not get this game played. And people did play Carson Pocket One and use the supply rules, but I redesigning it, the first thing I wanted to look at was let's get an ax to that. Mm -hmm. And I worked out three different systems to replace it of differing complexities. And I researched the hell out of it and found good solid sources that told me that a division required 200 tons or 50 tons or 20 tons of supplies a day in combat. Oh, good. Um, I got some numbers on how much was flown in to the pocket. I got, you know, from which I could calculate, okay, and there were this many, there was feeding. And, uh, and while I was doing all that, I thought, step back, squint, and see what it looks like. The big picture. And what was the big picture? The big picture was nobody really failed to be able to fight due to a lack of supplies, but nobody was able to fight at full efficiency unless they were really tied in tightly with a good supply block, of which there were very few possible. So I went to the old simple system but I put a few modifications. Can I? Yeah, I'll talk about that. Extra supply. That's the equivalent of starting the game with a pile of artillery ammo markers behind each front. The Soviets are the only ones who get it because they were building up for this offensive. The Germans were not um, and didn't have the extra ammo to do that with anyway. Um, so and for two way, turns, the game reflects it with double firepower, right? For for everything but heavy artillery. The heavy double those right. numbers. It made an absurd result. So heavies do not, that means the heavy rocket launch, the 300 millimeter rocket launchers and the 210s and 203s, well, the 203s for the Soviets and the 152 guns can't do that. Okay. Um, everybody else can. Okay. So for two turns, you can blaze away. That's what you have to blow a hole in the front line. Can't do that any other time during the game. And if you're using random weather or historical weather, because historically it was foggy the first morning, oh, too bad for you. That cut your artillery strengths in half. They're doubled and halved. Okay, so you're doing better than you would be without the extra shells, but it's not what you were hoping for. Okay, then there's normal supply. If you can trace one movement for that type of unit receiving the supplies, whether foot, horse, or motorized, if you could trace one movement to a valid supply source, you're in normal supply and function normally. No further implications. If you can trace a supply line, but it's further than one move, in some games, now you're just, you're out of supply. Well, no, you're getting some. You're just not getting as much. Um, so you can function, but there are some limits on how well you can function. If your supply line is cut, you're now can't get any more supplies, but you've got whatever you have with you. So you're limited in what you can do, but you can still fight. You fight, you just used your ammo. Now you're out of supply completely and you're in deep trouble. Okay, so for getting supply, there's the, the supply, you know, the roads that are on the map and air supply. And then you can both traced to a field that has a transport unit on it that has brought in supplies, or you can airdrop supplies a little bit, which can keep a few counters still functional, but not too many. Um, and like that, and it's a lot simpler and it produces pretty much the same effect. It's not quite as fine tuned as the artillery ammunition rules gave you, but the price in time is a lot cheaper. So we went that way. Similarly with air. In the old game, there was anti-aircraft firing at planes and planes taking losses and fighters intercepting other planes and air-to-air -air combat 
and I, you know, when you step back and look at it, you go, did it matter? Does it now? Um, Stephen would answer if he only knew how. Uh, who cares? Air-to-air -air combat is attritional and takes place over time. And it has no major impact on the situation on the ground, which is what we're modeling here. Um, the only thing that matters is ordnance and supplies delivered to the ground. So I took out all the air-to-air. -air. The anti-aircraft makes it less effective to fly air support if there's an anti-aircraft unit there. That's all. We're not shooting at planes. We're not keeping track. Um, there are ways to destroy enemy aircraft, but they are very few and basically for supply planes. Um, there was one day the Soviets got lucky. You, know, you can fly combat air patrol. So they're up in the air as long as they have fuel, you know, and they get, start getting low on fuel, they go home. So for a time, you can cover an airspace, assuming the weather's clear enough, they can intercept anything, see anything, no radar. Um, so they got lucky one day. They put combat air patrol over the course and airfield and caught a flight of German um, JU-52s coming in and bagged. Well, the Soviets claimed 13, the Germans said 14. So. I think we have a correlation there. Probably 14, yeah. <laughs> it only happened once. Yeah. And, and, and oh, I used to even have rules in the first game. There were rules for making airstrikes on off board airfields. So the Soviets could go after the German airfields, which they did. Um, Uman was hit repeatedly. Um, and this interfered with the supply system, but okay. enough. And one aspect that is also important is the weather. And, and, and you have weather. I mean, when we think about weather in games, it's like uh, one weather table and, and if, but your game divides it in, in various. Uh, First, it uh, divides it into warm and cold. Warm and cold, yes. Yeah, so cold weather, the ground is either frozen or it's snow. And this can be effective. There's precipitation in cold weather, it's snow. Could be snow, could be a blizzard, a lot of snow. Um, blizzards are less frequent. Um, and this will have certain effects on movement, but you know, have one movement table for cold weather, frozen snow, boom. When it gets warmer, that snow melts. And if it rains and snow melt, you got mud. mud and yeah. got, if it rains for a while, the mud's gonna get pretty nasty and you've got deep mud. And when it's deep mud, you can hardly move at all. And it also destroys airfields, roads, foxhole positions. It's a game changer, right? <laughs> it's a game changer. And the Germans had lousy luck with the weather during the battle. It was cold for the initial Soviet break-in and surrounding them. When the Germans came to counterattack, it got warm, um, which slowed the attack substantially. Um, but both sides get the same weather. So as the Germans are slowed, Guess who else is slow? Um, and the Soviets have reserves to react to the attacks, but they can't get into position if they're slowly grinding through the mud quite as quickly. So yes, I emphasized the weather because it had a big effect on the battle. And I noticed um, that that you uh, you admitted that the weather can be a very important factor that can ruin the best laid plan. So you included optional rules for players not to be bound by the historical weather and you also have the option and you can also play historical weather but the problem with playing historical weather is either of you can look at the chart and see what it's going to be in a week. it's coming yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. And weather forecasting was not that good um but if you use random weather jeff and i play tested the opening scenario for first ukrainian front and we used randomized weather, see how it worked. And it was warm and it stayed warm and it rained and it rained. <laughs> and the Soviet offensive didn't get started hardly. Yeah. Um, and it kept raining and it's all up to the dye and the dye doesn't give a damn. Um, it'll do whatever it wants. And we realized this is not fun. So I both added a way that if it's been warm for a certain amount of time, you start modifying the dice so that eventually it'll get cold and this vice versa. 
um, which is realistic. And I also said, you know, the rules are not shackled to your wrists. You're playing the game to have a good time. If you want, decide that's happening in midsummer. It's all warm. Um, there won't be any snow or frozen, but only when it rains is it gonna cause you problems. Um, and, or if you're stuck in a long warm period and both of you are really tired of this crap, um, make it cold. Mm. I won't, I won't take you to court. Um, but if you wanna do the historical, do the historical and see what the conditions both sides face and you can compare what you did to what happened historically. Yeah, there's all kinds of gamers, right? You got the people who, who uh, has to be faithful to history, has to be historical. And you have people who say, hey, it's more, his, it's more realistic if I don't know what weather is coming, right? So. Yeah. Now there's another, that's a good point because not knowing most of my designs had features to make it harder to know what the other guy had. Um, whether dummies and using the counter backs only until you had reconnoitered somehow to find out what was under there. Um, I like surprises. I like people going, what? Hold it. That wasn't what I thought was going on. And having to think, I don't know what's in that line. If I was holding it, I would put the stronger units there. But this guy has played me before. He knows how I think. Maybe he put them there instead in case I did something off kilt. You know, uh, and those kind of games, I love. That's, that separates the sheep from the goats. And some gamers cannot stand it. It drives them crazy. Yeah, they, they, they want to have full control over everything. Yeah, you every can't... stack, count the yeah. factors, decide who they're going to move to attack it. Yeah. And if you think that reflects reality, no particularly in this um, particular war at this phase, um, you're out of your mind. Um, you play something else, don't play my game. Um, here, you just can't sort through a stack to see what your opponent has. You can look at your own. Um, you yes. can't look at your opponents. Yes. Um, no, because not. again, any system that denied you that information would be such a burden on players. It's bad enough with you know um, markers and foxhole or fortification markers and out of supply markers and you still you, know, you can't see what's in there it's hard to find your own stuff okay. um so that aspect wasn't wasn't considered okay. i put in headquarters units but they don't do much yeah, I noticed that. yeah. going to artillery which i noticed that you, ah. you focus a lot on artillery and yes and i think you try to draw a distinction between german artillery and russian artillery. the russians they have to be emplaced okay. to work, right? What that, and that was not entirely realistic. That was a bit of SPI's influence on me. Okay. But it, it models, not directly, but it models something real, which is to get the best out of your artillery, you have to set it up and figure out exactly where it is um, and register it figure out where the shells will fall if we're pointed this way at this elevation. And you can't just be blazing away the moment you unhin, you know, unlimber, um, unless you're firing direct fire, in which case you can in this game. So, and the Soviets were a little slower with their communications. And it also represents like an artillery regiment or uh, regiment uh, will be, or battalion will be one counter but in fact, there's also the supply trucks and the communication uh, system and so forth. It's a lot of stuff to move around and get set up. And by forcing them to register, to get their guns in place before they can be used, um, it slows. So the artillery can't just roll from place to place and shoot every time. There's a delay. Mm -hmm. And the delay, I thought, think is not unrealistic. The exact mechanism is not all that realistic. It's a little bit of SPI's anti-Soviet bias, um, <laughs> but it works. It's so like I design use. for effect, right? You want to, you want to. Yeah, this is a design effect for effect. It takes a while to set up. And I noticed for artillery, you can, uh, you have 
obviously various aspects. You can use it for bombardment. You can use it for, I think you have a final protective fire, which is a way of using it to support the defenders in an attack, right? Yeah. You add the final protective fire factor, which is different from the barrage factor, to the defense strength. And, and then when you look at the ranges of the artillery units, there some have very short ranges. So you have to be very careful where you, where you place them, right? From between two hexes and 15 hexes is the range of the artillery. Um, so the, the mortars, the heavy mortars, and the, uh, the heavy rockets, um, and the Nebelwerfers all have to be pretty close to the front. Um, your other, your heavy, your long range guns, your heavy guns, you can set them up, you know, 10 hexes away and they can still cover. Um, and this is very important when you're setting up both the attack and the defense. The defender has to carefully figure where do I place my guns so that they can give support to the most units possible? Um, and the attacker, you know, how do I, if particularly at the beginning of the game when the Soviets are very concentrated, how do I find a place to put those guns that's close enough to the front that they will have some reach and be able to keep firing for several turns as the front moves and yet not get in the way of the deployment of other forces that I want up at the front um, sooner. Yeah. Um, and it's, again, problems without necessarily all good solutions. You got it. That's right. Them. Because when you move, when you move artillery, I noticed that also you, you have to place a counter behind it, which is the... Uh, you don't place a counter behind it, but the artillery uh, column marker has a theoretical counter yeah, behind right, it. Yeah. So they take up more room on the roads. They take Again, up more room. Yes, that's right. This is not exactly realistic. What it is, is it suggests that an artillery unit has more of a logistical train, its ammo trucks, its communication gear, its local security, um, all the guys to hump all the shells. Um, and it also abstracts some of the other rear area functions that tend to be moving at the same time as artillery um, so that it takes space on the roads. And to move anywhere, you move in column on the roads. You're more vulnerable, um, but you're not gonna make any time going cross country anywhere. And yeah, for the heavy sure. artillery, you yeah. can't even move at all without going into column. Yeah. The column system I took straight from Vakdam Ryan, I added the artillery columns, but the column system I took straight off of there and it does a number of things very well. It conceals the units. That's right. It means that you can't move a, say an 11 counter rifle division um, all as one stack. And when they reach where you want to get them, they're all right there and you spread them out and you've got your position. They're coming up the road and each one is a little further back and it will take time. So again, here you got a problem, traffic control. Yeah. Who's got the priority on the roads? The engineers, we need them to fix the bridges and build more roads. Better have some engineers near the front. Um, the anti-tank, well, we probably won't need them for a little while because the Germans, you know, will take a while to react, but got to put them somewhere. Or, you know, we'll, when we want them, we don't want to be waiting for them. Um, the artillery, um, oh, where am I going to fit all this around the armor and the infantry and the cavalry? and the, So it, again, forces the players to make choices to which there are not enough good answers. And you got to plan ahead. Yeah, you got you got to think some turns ahead because yes. to get... It's going to take a few turns to get these guys from point A to point B and then set up. And then so, set up. And if, you got, if you're moving from point A to defend at point B, you not only have to get there, get through traffic, you then have to dig in and place your guns. And so if you don't get them moving on this turn, six turns later, they're not going to be down the line where you want them. And you're going to be sorely needing them. Um, the, the second Ukrainian front has the biggest mass of counters, just a huge blob of three stack counters, you know, and you think, oh, how can I ever deal with this? 
Well, about five turns later, you're going to be wishing you had a couple more divisions um, to <laughs> thicken the line somewhere and to deal with another threat or opportunity. Um, yeah, so it's like that. And I noticed um, so so that, that traffic was a major emphasis. Artillery was a major emphasis. Mm -hmm. And the tank system that I used, which I never understood why everybody didn't adopt. I think I stole the idea from Atlantic Wall. Um, Joe Balkowski first introduced it there. Mm -hmm. um, but it's essentially, and here's, here's an important part of the game um, dynamic. You have a tank brigade or a German panzer battalion, and it has these strengths. And it has an attack strength and a defense strength, but it also has a tank strength. And that is both your tank and your anti-tank factor for that tank unit. So say a T-34 brigade that is 4412, and I'll talk about the 12 in a minute. That's a mistake I made in design. Um, I'll reveal it. Um, and you also have a tank strength of three. Now, the essential question that I resolved in my mind was that the difference between a few tanks and no tanks at all is infinitely larger than the difference between a few tanks and a few tanks more. So the very presence of armor, especially if they're attacking something without much in the way of anti-tank strength, is based on what kind of tanks they are more than how many of them there are. So the Tigers, the Panthers, the JS-1s, the KV-85, um, the SU-85s, the SU-152s, um, they all have tank strengths of four. Even if they're a very weak unit with an attack strength of one or two, they have the same attack tank strength of four. So they're extremely effective defending against other tanks, and they're extremely effective against infantry or other targets that don't have a good anti-tank strength to match against them. Because the difference in tank strength versus anti-tank strength in an attack will act as column shifts. Yeah, column shifts. Um, so the Germans, who can break their battalions down into companies, you might have a one, one, ten tank company. But if it's still got a tank strength of four, it hits like that. It will only add one to the, to the combat uh, odds. But if the four is up against a one, you will have three shifts going for you. Um, but, and I like to do this, you get something, you give something. Um, use tanks in a combat, use their tank strengths. But if you have to take losses, the first loss is going to come from the largest tank unit you use. Yeah. Um, and this is historically accurate. Um, but the old days of, uh, don't I have a Sturmgeschütz uh, battalion in there somewhere I can sacrifice that the Panzer Division takes no losses? Mm. So in the original design, you didn't have that? It No. And um, it didn't work that way in reality, and it didn't work that way in this game. Mm -hmm. um, so, and that's a big, big fact. Tanks are a major factor in the game. Um, when And so is anti-tank stuff. The German... Um, Flak units and anti-tank battalions and the same the Soviets who have tons of anti-tank stuff. I did another game that was never published um, called Brusilov um, about the fighting in, not just up the way from Carson Pocket um, in the, at the end of the winter of 43. And I gave it up. I sent the, the playtest copy to somebody to look at who was interested, but I was not going to publish it because I played it and it was good history. It was excellent history. And what it was, was the Germans are attacking. They attack a village 
which is defended by a Soviet, typically a battalion or more, with some anti-tank guns, and they lose some tanks, and they lose some infantry, and the Soviets lose some infantry and some anti-tank guns, and fall back, and now you do it again at the next village, and the next village, and the next village, and the next village, and no breakthroughs, steady attrition, and no. <laughs> or, I've done this before. It doesn't do anything, which was exactly what happened in the battle. Um, so yeah. what else did I emphasize? Uh, there was one thing that called my attention that, I, well, I think you probably took this from Dunnigan. I'm not sure. My first game ever was France 1940, which had a stacking rule similar to yours, which is you could stack up to three cores in a hex, but only one core equivalent can attack out of the hex and defend in yeah. the hex. And you have the same yeah. thing here. You can stack. This is straight out of Octa Rhine. Oh, the okay. only difference is I had the companies, which gave the Germans a little edge. Um, I think, again, I was influenced by SPI's German worship um, on that, because the Soviets were just as capable tactically as the Germans at this stage of the war. Um, but it gives the Germans an opportunity to, be once again, here you go, okay? So you've got, uh, you know, an eight eight, 10, I think, um, Tiger Battalion, tank strength of four. You can break it up into three companies, which are going to be probably two, two tens, um, but with a tank strength of four. And that can really give you, it spreads your anti-tank and it spreads your tank, you know, strengths to several points, but not a lot of combat strength and take losses. Who takes the hit? Boom, that company's gone. Yeah. Well, now you can't reassemble your battalion. And that battalion would be a really powerful force for cracking one point um, or holding one point. So you got a choice. Yeah. Um, but you also get battalions, you can have three stacked in a hex. Only two can use their combat strengths. Um, if you've got, if you're the Germans, you can have three and a company or some combination of companies and less battalions. And this gives you a little tactical edge. Yeah. And um, it works. Yeah. And, and, and I also noticed there's a, there's a bonus for, I think it's a regimental, like integrity bonus kind of thing that if you yeah. have two battalions of the same That's regiment. That's real artificial. And I, I added that to the game, and here's how it works. Okay. If you got two battalions of the same regiment, part, uh, okay, two battalions of the same regiment, you get one shift for your regimental support. Um, this is the small amount of infantry guns, heavy mortars, and so forth that the regiment, and anti tank guns that the regiment has as its assets. And it doesn't really rate a shift. Um, if you get right down to it. But what it does, it forces the players to keep their divisions together as units. Because if you don't do that, soon you've got cardboard swimming everywhere and you have no idea I noticed that. what yeah. any of it is or <laughs> where it goes, and you will lose your mind. I and know. you will not be able to play the game effectively. No, and the thing is, some players, you know, they... They take gamey approaches. Like, I need two combat factors. Let's pull these guys from this division over here. To, yeah. You know, now, that doesn't happen. That does happen, actually, in reality. And you will see it in the German order of battle, where you will find, here's this division, and it has two of its own regiments and another regiment that it borrowed from somebody else and one artillery battalion that came from a division that got destroyed, except for that battalion, and um, some security troops who got herded in, you know, here, you guys hold that part of the line. Ow! Oh, we'll get back to you on that. Um, and uh, yeah, so, but you really need to focus on keeping your troops organized or you will lose control of the situation. And this is historically accurate. But the problem is there is no good game you know, in a computer game, you could factor that in and the rules would make you do it um, or penalize you if you didn't. Here, it's harder. It gives 
The Soviets, a little better chance to be effective with their infantry when attacking. It gives the Germans a little better chance on defense when they can actually mass, which is seldom. There's also a way in which behind a river, you can get that same bonus if the units are not stacked, but adjacent. So that gives you a little easier chance to stretch out and cover a river line, yeah. um, which is appropriate. For the, for the Germans, adjacency works for the regimental uh, yes. bonus, right? For the Soviets, it doesn't. But right. the Soviets have three battalions per regiment. So that means they can lose one. They still have another one they can put in there. And they still have it. The Germans, they've yeah. been, they did this reorganization, which they watered down their units. And now what you have is... They didn't water down their units. The Soviets bled them white. <laughs> okay. And all they could do was consolidate to have, you know, hey, we've got a battalion here, but it's only got 60 men in it and three yeah. machine guns. But the Germans um, only have two battalions per regiment, right? Yeah. So they got to be very careful. You lose one and there goes that bonus. Yeah. Yeah, so that's a... Uh, that's, uh, I, yeah, I like Germans, that. It's, the it's, Germans it's, were up against the wall in this battle. Yeah. Um, all their defensive lines were thin and barely holding on. Um, and where the Soviets could mass against the line and conceal it, which they were pretty good at. Um, you read Glantz's book on deception. And um, then the Germans are going to be in trouble. There was going to be a hole punched. Um, no way around it. And Jack, I noticed in the game there's rules for engineers you can construct and blow up things in this game what's what are those things well engineers are quite important in this game and your motto should be no engineer ever sits idle if they're not doing something you're doing something wrong um, they can build fortifications these are really helpful if you're trying to set up a defensive line they take a while and you can't build them directly adjacent to the enemy but um, if you know you're going to be falling back, better have some engineers back there building fortifications and being in position to blow up bridges. Bri blowing bridges will really slow your opponent um, and can be you know, vital um, in terms of being able to construct supply lines. Um, what else can you blow up? Uh, probably a few other things. They may be, I don't remember if you can blow up airfields or not. Maybe not, um, not really important. Um, you can also build stuff, building, repairing bridges that have been blown up mm -hmm. or um, every Panzer division and tank corps and mech corps carries its own pontoon bridge with it. You can emplace the pontoon bridge. Um, you can also pick it up and take it somewhere else and build it across a different river. Um, you can build roads, and this is really important, uh, particularly for the Soviets, who are cursed with a really bad road net on the second Ukrainian front side, to be able to keep supplies going up to the front, having engineers in position to build those roads, which you can build at the rate of two hexes um, per turn. Um, and there are markers for that, although probably not enough to cover every hex of the road, but if you put them every other hex, you'll know what's there. Um, yeah, I noticed that every, every Soviet rifle division is represented obviously by the infantry battalions, which is usually nine. And then you have their artillery regiment, an artillery regiment. But then you have the anti-tank battalion and you have an engineer battalion for each rifle division, right? Yep, yep. Same for each German division has its own engineer battalion. And both sides have additional non-divisional engineering assets. The Soviets have a whole brigade of them over on second Ukrainian front side, which can be very valuable. You could space these guys out along an area where you want a road, and then the next turn, each of them builds two hexes. And if they're close enough to each other, you've now got a road extending a 10 hexes. Um, and that could be a big help. Um, so there's all that. And it's easily overlooked. Players, new players um, will often have their engineers sitting, I don't know what to do with them. You know, they're not good enough to be combat units. Also, they can fight. 
They have a little more anti-tank strength than infantry um, in their ability with mines and demolitions and flamethrowers. Oh, and there are three Soviet. There's two Soviet flamethrower battalions and a assault engineer battalion. And they are all very useful for attacking fortified positions, villages, and the like, and towns. And, and I noticed, I know this is not on topic, but I just I realized there's an armored train counter, right? Oh, yes, there is. And it's um, not and Russia. Russia rules it's not trouble Russia. about that one armored train counter that you can shake a stick at. I probably just should have omitted the thing. Armored trains were of almost no use. It's just a few artillery pieces on a flat car. Oh, it's armored, but so what? Um, it's very vulnerable. Anybody gets behind it and blows the rails. Oh, now what do we do? Um, I just encountered a description of the Soviet, a Soviet attempt to use an armored train in the front line during the Battle of Moscow, and it did not end well, um, which is to be expected. Uh, but yeah, the Germans have an armored train over on the 8th Army side, and there's a limited amount of track it can run up. And it's just one more unit with some special abilities, good for guarding a bridge, uh, something like that. But since it was there, I couldn't resist. There's a certain romance to armored trains. Um, but it's there, it's there, you know. It's there. <laughs> It's there. It was counted on the German order of battle list. So uh, there it is. So, Jack, what's the status production wise of the game at this time? We have completed 99% of the production process, and it has been three bears. It's been amazing. The amount you've, you've seen the size of the package, and every bloody bit of it had to be proofread over and over and over and over and over and over. And there were some procedural problems about keeping versions of particular items straight. We resolved all that eventually, but it's, if you go to proofread a 2400 counter mix, and that's 4,800 counter sides, each with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine bits of you know, information on it, <laughs> After a while, your mind glazes, not your eyes. The whole thing goes glassy, and you, you don't know what you're looking at anymore, and so you miss things. Um, and both of us were doing this proofreading, and still, I just heard from Kev Sharp that he's looking at the situation map in the prototype, not the final, the prototype, um, for the February 1st scenario. And 16th and 17th Panzer divisions aren't on it. What? How did that happen? I have no idea. It's harder to see things that aren't there than things that are. But um, good Lord. Um, so it has been a long production process. And it's being printed in Hong Kong. Like the first Carson Pocket, this is a union shop, but communication from two different languages and with several people working on it. And there have been some disruptions at our end in terms of health crises and the like, which have disrupted the process at times, which is how some of these errors slip through. The fact that you have a counter mix that is not the right counter mix, um, an earlier file got printed, um, Makes me want to tear my hair out, but reminds me that Jeff is a genius for deciding to get the prototypes printed. We will have everything tight. We are shooting for a game without errata. Although, as we all know, to err is human, to errata is war game publishing. Um, it's in the Bible. Look it up. Um, <coughs> we're really trying to get this right. And I believe we will get there. I really believe it. it's very close. Um, I've just sent corrections off for the latest version of the counters this morning. And I don't anticipate a lot more problems. 
Now, there are some problems that you may encounter and Kev is encountering, and I'm sure people will encounter, which is I don't write your average rules. As we've discussed already, I write rules for people I assume are pretty intelligent and knowledgeable about the subject. And I expect them to be able to read my writing and make sense out of it. It's not Don Greenwood style. Every last T is not really crossed and there's room for interpretation. I've never had a problem with that playing the game. I know there are people who have serious, fatal problems playing the game. They have a heart attack, they try. Um, what do you mean? It doesn't, it doesn't say that I can't advance forward You know, when I have to retreat a hex. There's nowhere in the rules that says which direction, so I'm gonna go that way. Yeah. No, you're not, asshole. <laughs> Why would you wanna do that? You know, What are you playing? If you wanna play, a you know play go play chess <laughs> play checkers you know it, it's very clear what you can and can't do um yeah. here you have to understand this is a historical model a competitive historical model to be sure but a historical model and some appreciation for the history will take you a long ways to getting around any rules ambiguity and every group I've ever played in that I stayed for more than 10 minutes had a simple system. Okay, I think this rule says that. I don't think so. I think it says that. Okay, each man make your case, take about two minutes. And if one of you will agree to the other, good. If not, drop a die, high man wins. On we go. And that is the way the rule will be read for the rest of this game. Okay, afterwards, we can have a long discussion about why or why not. Playing miniatures, I played miniatures for 20 years um, after I got out of board gaming. And um, we had a guy in the group who was a lieutenant colonel in the R in cavalry. So if he said, this isn't right, the way the rule works for moving a tank up to get into a hold down position, he'd done it. We'll go with your version, Gary. <laughs> you know, yeah. no argument. I don't care what it says in the rules book. Defer to him. Yeah. <laughs> and I've never, I, I'm not a religious person. I do not believe in sacred texts. I do not believe because the designer wrote it down and he knows more than you. It's right. <laughs> it might be, but I'm pretty smart. And I've done a lot of reading on the subject. And I don't think he's right at all. So I'm going to do it this way. My game, I bought it. He's got the money. He should be happy. I'm happy. I got the game and I can play it the way I think is right. And if I'm playing it competitively, we come to an agreement about how we're gonna do it. And then we play and we don't argue while we're playing. We let the dice, you know, subtly arguments. Okay. Works much better for me. Don't be a schmuck. Don't be a schmuck. Why? That, what what do you get be, out of it? That, that should know? be in every rule book, you know? <laughs> it should, it should. I think in the original course in pocket, I said, if you really like playing games in a way that allows you to run a panzer division between two paragraphs of rules to get into the enemy's rear. <laughs> I got a rule for you. When your opponent gets up to go to the bathroom, which he will, <laughs> guaranteed, this is a big game. It's going to happen. Okay. When he goes out of the room, take his counters off the board. You won. <laughs> I said so. I'm the designer. It's right there. That's a victory condition. The other counter, if one player's counters are off the board, he loses. You, yeah. you enjoy that? <laughs> yeah, I know. You figure I know. he's going to play any more games with you? I don't. I wouldn't. So that's, that's my philosophy. And that's how this game, that's the state of mind this game was designed with. And I'll tell you a story. The first Origins I was there, the, um, Northern Minnesota Monster Gaming Club, which became the, the, nation mon the National Monster Gaming Club later. But they put on a scenario, of course, in pocket as a competition. And I offered a copy of the game as the prize. And um, they took the first scenario, the first Ukrainian fronts attack, and they modified it for the competition. And a bunch of kids signed up and played it. And the winner came up to the table to announce that he had won. And what they had done is they had thrown a curve at him. They had said, okay, you are the Soviet, you're commanding six tank army. Um, here's your objective. Boom. 
And he was well on his way to his objective when they said, okay, you just got new orders. Your objective is at turn left, for, you know, uh, 90 degrees. That's your objective. And he regrouped and punched out and got it. And um, I said, yes, indeed. And the kid was wearing an Acapulco gold t-shirt. <laughs> and I said, yes, indeed, son. That's just how the game was designed. Um, no wonder you understand it so well. <laughs> and um, that's right. You know, you need some flexibility of mind yeah. um, to be a good gamer. I think we all need it in life, right? We all need it in life. <laughs> because that's the way, that's, I think that's what these games really teach us, how humans behave in real life. Yeah. And, and, and that's what you try to model, what humans do in real life, not Nobody's omnipresent. Nobody knows everything. Nobody can control right. everything. There's a lot of uncertainty. And so uh, I think for, for me, that's why I play games. I, I like to see how I like that time travel aspect, immersion. I'm in this situation and I don't control. I don't have all the knowledge. I don't have a monopoly on, on, on information. So let's do what we think it's best right now. It may backfire. Who knows? Let's see and, and go for it. And, and it, it's a gut check. You know, you, I love games where I say it's like putting your hand into a box and you can't see in the box, but you're aware of the distinct possibility there's a snake in there. <laughs> so yeah. your turn, what you gonna do? Right. Um, and some people freak out and can't yeah. do it. And other people just think of US Grant and Grant's big insight from the Civil War was on his first operation when he was sent out with a small force to find and destroy a Confederate um, uh, force. And as he said, as he approached this hill where he knew the opponent was likely camped on the other side, the closer he got, the more his gut was tightening and the more he was scared. What is he going to do to me? What surprise has he prepared? How am I gonna look like a fool? And reached the top of the hill and could see the last of the Confederates running out the far side of the camp, um, skedaddling for the woods. And it occurred to him, oh, he was thinking the same thing about me. <laughs> so from now on, I'm not going to worry about what they're going to do. I'm going to worry about what I'm going to do to them. And if you go into a game with that mindset, you will do far better. Yeah, that's right. So Jack, are, are, you by, are you working on any designs are currently or not really? Well, no. <laughs> I'm working on the history of the Battle of Moscow in October of 1941. I have about 35 chapters written. It'll probably go 100. I've been working on it for years with Charles Sharp, and it will be the definitive book on the battle based on a mountain of German and Soviet sources, all translated by Mr. Sharp. Um, and that's what I'm doing. Okay, um, I like my history straight, no dice. That sounds great. <laughs> well, Jack, I wanna thank you for, for giving me the opportunity to interview you and, uh, and I wish you the best with Korzun Pocket 2, little Stalingrad on the Nepper. And uh, it's gonna be uh, published by Pacific Rim Publishing. And uh, thank you for sending me a prototype. I, I, I have a lot of followers that are monster gamers. And, and as we stated, that's an acquired taste. And I always wanted to do videos for them, but I never had an opportunity until now. I've been with the channel for almost nine years. So this is the first monster game I do a video of. And it's a pleasure that I had a chance to also interview you in the process. So I want to thank you also for that. My pleasure. Enjoy. Let me add one thing, because I don't think I finished the question of the status of it right now. Oh, okay. Let me be sure. Um, we had four prototypes printed, um, which were for reviewers and for our review to make sure that nothing had gotten through. And oh, yeah, some things got through. So we are making the corrections right now. Um, Jeff, as I speak, um, is working on the final counter corrections. Um, this will all go off to a publisher. Here's the situation. We have asked people to make a pre-order of the game. This gets them the discount price of $225. In fact, 
all games will be sold at this discount to people who pre-ordered. We're not going to... Now, there, okay, Jeff said he will round up to the next 100 on the amount we get above 500 and make that many games. Um, we can afford to do that. But you send in a pre-order to Pacific Rim Publishing, go to the pre-order tab, and you give your name and your email. That's it. No money. Then once this review and other reviews come out and we get about 150 more pre-orders for the 500 that we need, everyone will get an email. It will contain a confirmation of your pre-order and your product code. You then send back the order with that product code and your credit card number. At that moment, Jeff tells the pub, the printer, go. Then assuming, and I'm not assuming because so many things have happened in this project, assuming the container containing those games does not blow off the top of the container ship in mid-Pacific, <laughs> um, they will be delivered to Oakland and Jeff will be mailing them out postage free to anyone in the continental US. The price for overseas will be determined, uh, he's probably figured that out by now, and put up on the website. And then everyone will live happily ever after. That's the plan. Okay. No money is put up front before the game is available. Um, and we're incredibly close to being completed. And boy, I, there were many times I thought we weren't going to make it. But okay. That's good. That's that's and I'm great. happy with the result. It looks good. I'm real happy that the rules book is in big type. <laughs> A lot of us have gotten to that age. <laughs> yeah. Well, Jack, I want to thank you for for the, the interview. Thanks for sending me the prototype. And uh, for me, it was a real pleasure. A joy. Thank you, Jose. Okay. We'll Thanks. see you. Thanks, Jack. Bye -bye. Okay. Thank you.